Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Jessica Weiss, Assistant Professor of Political Science and a Research Fellow at the Macmillan Center at Yale University. Her research interests include Chinese politics and international relations, nationalism, and social protest. Before joining the Yale faculty, she founded FACES, the Forum for American Chinese Exchange at Stanford University. She teaches courses on anti-Americanism in world politics, Chinese foreign policy, and state society relations in post-Mao China. Today we'll talk with her about her recent paper, Powerful Patriots, Anti-Foreign Protest in Authoritarian Regimes. Welcome, Professor Weiss. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about the argument you put forth in your paper. Tell us about it. Well, in the paper, which is uh, drawn from an excerpt of my larger book manuscript, mm -hmm. um, I argue that authoritarian leaders like China's have strategic incentives to allow anti-foreign protests, which is to say popular demonstrations against foreign governments. Mm -hmm. um, and the argument's a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, the idea is that uh, even though protests are risky mm -hmm. and uh, have the potential to turn against the government and spiral out of control, uh, governments like China's actually find that uh, these protests are useful in terms of generating diplomatic bargaining leverage. Mm -hmm. So that even though protests are risky, it's that risk uh, and the difficulty of reining them in once they begin uh, that give uh, leaders uh, sort of domestic political uh, reasons to claim then on the international stage that, uh, look, we're really here in a corner. Uh, if we're going to reach an agreement, you, the foreign government, need to cut us some slack. Okay. And what drew you to write this paper? What was your inspiration? Well, in 2005, there were a series of anti-Japanese protests that broke out in cities across China. Uh, and um, it seemed at the time that Western observers didn't have, um, let's say, a unified view of what was going on. There was a lot of uh, controversy. And in particular, there were two common views. One. Um, suggested that the government had manufactured these protests mm -hmm. um, either uh, as a way to rally the population around uh, the Chinese government uh, to provide citizens um, with sort of a safety valve mm -hmm. uh, to release their grievances of, of whatever sort. Um, but then from a completely opposite view, others suggested that these protests uh, were actually sort of the spontaneous eruption of legitimate grievances. Um, and which were quite dangerous to the government, that they actually, rather than being a safety valve, uh, could actually turn uh, against the government if it were seen as being uh, too weak uh, in defending the nation's interests. Um, so it was uh, clear from that particular episode, which I, um, which I analyze in this paper, um, that there was a gap in our understanding of what these protests meant and particularly what, they, uh, what their implications were for China's foreign relations. Okay, and let's talk about your methodology. How did you collect the data for the paper? Well, mostly um, I rely upon interviews and a close reading of uh, Chinese internet uh, websites. Um, I spent over a year in China living in Beijing doing my uh, field research. Mm -hmm. And um, it was clear through these interviews uh, with nationalist activists, um, protest organizers, participants, um, internet forum managers, uh, foreign ministry officials, uh, even a policeman, that there was a pattern uh, that this was not an isolated uh, incident, these mm -hmm. 2005 anti-Japanese protests. Um, and it was clear that um, although the Chinese government had allowed protests, nationalist protests in some cases in 2005, but also following the U.S. bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade in 1999, uh, the Chinese government had also, on a number of occasions, actually restrained students and others from taking to the streets, um, such as in 2001, when a U.S. spy plane collided with a Chinese fighter jet, uh, causing the Chinese um, plane to ditch into the sea and the pilot died. Um, you might have expected, in fact, some suggested that there were protests, but in fact, uh, the Chinese government prevented protests from occurring uh, and told the official media to turn down their rhetoric uh, in covering that incident. Uh, similarly, uh, on the issue of Taiwan, um, an issue of great concern to Chinese nationalists mm -hmm. and in the news today, uh, there haven't been to date any protests in China over the issue of Taiwan and, and Taiwan independence. Um, so this sort of created for me uh, a puzzle uh, that I uncovered as I looked further into the background of the 2005 protests, um, just 
uh, two years ago in the lead up to the Olympics, there were a series of anti-French protests. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, there's sort of multi-headed um, nationalism in China, and I think it's, uh, it's sort of little understood, but it's certainly uh, there's a lot of material out there um, in online in Chinese, but also um, foreign capitals pay great attention. So I, I looked at a lot of Japanese newspapers as well, mm -hmm. uh, interviewed Japanese and American officials uh, throughout the course of my research. Um, okay. um, I'm curious, were you able to talk to any Chinese officials or um, was that not possible? Just in terms to get their feedback, possibly. Mm -hmm. I did talk to a number uh -huh. of Chinese officials in different uh, settings. Sometimes mm -hmm. they would be visiting the United States and I'd have a chance to talk with them. Okay. Sometimes uh, I visited them in this, there's a Starbucks next to the foreign ministry in mm -hmm. Beijing, so sometimes I would see them there. Um, by and large, they were very open uh, to talking with me. Oh, really? Uh, and in fact, you know, in many cases they're looking to uh, sort of showcase China in a good light, and part of that is uh, interacting with the Chinese, uh, sorry, American academics mm -hmm. uh, and others who are interested in the study of China. Okay, great. Um, why is it important to look at authoritarian regimes like China um, and international conflict? Well, it's funny you should ask because, um, you know, maybe 50 years ago people would talk about autocracies as having um, sort of advantages because they're relatively opaque. It's hard to know what's exactly going on inside them. Mm -hmm. And by contrast, people would lament the inability of democracies to conduct foreign policy in sort of a, a sort of efficient manner. There's mm -hmm. this, all these compromise and uh, negotiations that would go on before uh, the country could articulate sort of its foreign policy. Um, but recently, um, scholarship has swung in the other direction. Um, and people have increasingly touted the advantages of democracy, of that same openness, um, and giving democracies advantages in all sorts of things like concluding trade agreements, mm -hmm. um, winning wars, fighting on the battlefield, all sorts of things, the uh, advantages that have been attributed to democracies. And a scholarship on um, the behavior of autocracies in international relations and international conflict has, in recent years, only begun to pick up. Mm -hmm. And sort of in this context, um, I, the argument that I put forward essentially levels the playing field um, between autocratic states like China and, and democratic states like the United States. So the argument that I put forward basically says that if you could imagine, say, a, a Democrat and autocrat sitting at a table negotiating, um, traditionally, you would, some might say that the, the Democrat, the president or the prime minister, could say to the, his autocratic counterpart, look, Congress has spoken, um, I've pinned, basically, I don't have any flexibility. So if we're going to reach a deal, you, the autocrat, have to give way. And what I'm suggesting is that the autocrat may not face elections, but nonetheless, with mobs in the streets, he can say, well, you may have Congress, but look at me, I've got mobs. Mm -hmm. And we, as we know that the, the consequences of being voted out of office are far uh, less than perhaps the consequences of the mob um, storming the palace gates and, and potentially um, throwing the dictator into exile or something much worse. Sure. Let's talk about some of the conclusions you reach in your paper. Well, in the paper, I suggest that the anti-Japanese protests of 2005 uh, were an effective part of China's diplomatic strategy to undermine Japan's bid for um, permanent membership on the UN Security Council. Uh, and uh, in doing so, um, the Chinese were able to uh, mount a campaign, um, particularly um, persuading um, those in the region, um, particularly uh, the United States and uh, nations in Southeast Asia, um, from tempering their public support for Japan's bid to be a permanent member of the Security Council. Okay. And uh, finally, in doing the research for your paper, um, what was um, one of the most surprising things you found? Well, you know, people often uh, assume that because China is an autocratic state that the people are more or less fed what the government wants mm -hmm. them to hear. That there's a sense in which they aren't particularly well informed about uh, foreign affairs or in politics in general. And I actually found that to be absolutely not the case. Um, and in fact, uh, Chinese citizens, whether it's uh, you know, your students in universities or uh, you know, the notorious Beijing taxi cab drivers, they know a lot. In fact, they, I would wager that they know more about international relations than uh, sort of their American equivalents. And so even though there's I mean, perhaps less space for uh, political discourse, 
Um, nevertheless, um, the amount of information and their knowledge of world affairs is really quite striking. Interesting. Thank you very much for being here with us today and sharing some of your research. You're welcome. For more information about Professor Weiss and her work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.